speak about finding hyper-exponential solutions of differential equations. Thank you, Doron. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, and thanks for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here. I've been here three times, I think, or maybe four. I didn't remember when. Uh, and always when I've been giving a talk here, hi. Uh, I've been trying to be very polite. Uh, but today, politeness stops. <laughs> uh, today I've prepared a talk that consists of two critical offenses. The first is in the very beginning, and the second is in the very end. And it will be offensive to at least one person in the room, but assuming that the others are influenced by that one person that I have in mind, it may be offensive to also the others. Um, so I advise you, if you are, uh, if you have a weak heart, or if you are under 18 in age, and maybe you don't want to attend this talk. So let me start with the first offense. I will be talking about solving differential equations in closed form. And this is offensive because here we are in holonomic land, and uh, what Doran keeps telling us is that if you want to solve a differential equation, like a linear one with polynomial coefficients, then the best way to represent the solution is the equation itself, because it determines the solution uniquely if you have initial values. Um, and that's, uh, that's true and convincing for most of the cases, but for the purpose of this talk, I will claim that the, best, the most important thing you have to do when you have a differential equation is ask for closed forms. And after the talk, uh, we are back in holonomic land and we don't ask this anymore. So it's just for the purpose of this talk, I will, I will ask, how do we find, given an equation, how do we compute the closed form? So in, in other words... Closed form is a stupid human obsession. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's offended already. <laughs> but wait for the second offense, it's much harder. Um, okay. Uh, so what happens when in Maple you say desolve? That's the question. Um, it finds you, or well, it tries very hard to find, uh, to find a, uh, a closed form solution. And the problem starts already there, because what is a closed form solution? A closed form is not as well defined notion as like continuous or differential or, or some integral or so. So, uh, okay, wait, uh, wait a second. So here this is, this is a kind of problem that, that may be input. So there's one uh, independent variable x always. There's no, no PDE, no x and y, just x, just x and numbers. And there's one unknown function which depends on this x, and the equation we have is always of this form. It has the f and its derivatives, not necessarily two, maybe more. And there are polynomials in front of these coefficients, uh, in front of these derivatives. And it's linear and it's something like this. So what we want to know is uh, what are the f's that satisfies this equation. And in this case, so the answer may be uh, like e to the x satisfies it. This is something you can check by inspection, so, uh, because then all of these things are equal, you just have to add up these polynomials and see whether it makes zero. So this plus this is zero, this plus this minus this is zero, and this plus this plus this is also zero, and so on, so this fits. And then this one you can do at home, I don't do it for you. And, and these are the two, the two equations, I mean the two solutions of this equation, there's no other, every other solution is a linear combination of those two with constant coefficients. And you got this equation going backwards for me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, but here we are, we are going forward today, so that today we are, we are assuming we are given this and we want this as output. Okay, so I, asked, I said already, a closed form is not a well defined notion. So when we want to be precise about what a closed form is, we have to make a choice uh, what kind of closed form we are talking about. So here are some possibilities. Uh, you can ask, uh, given an equation, what are the polynomials? A polynomial solution that satisfies, so uh, solutions that look like this. Um, there may be such solutions or not. Uh, if not, you can go to the next higher complicated class, more complicated class, would be rational functions. Asking. Uh, whether the differential equation has solutions that can be written as the quotient of two polynomials. I want to emphasize that when I say rational functions, I don't mean functions. I just mean formally, algebraically, quotients of two polynomials. Now, uh, again, such a solution may exist or not, and we want an algorithm that finds them all and tells us there are no others. And if there are no others, then the next more complicated thing you can look up is what we call hyper-exponential functions. Again, these are not functions, these are just algebraic objects, but you can think of them as expressions that can be written in this form. So x of some rational function times 
something that is almost like a rational function, except that the exponents can be arbitrary numbers, they need not be integers. So this is called a uh, hyper-exponential function. It's something that satisfies first-order differential equation. No, the I expression that could also be viewed as functions. Yeah. Yeah. For example, as functions. No, no, it's not a function. It may be viewed as a function. If, maybe that's the second offense. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, algebraic functions is next. If you don't have the hyper-exponential function, you can ask, are there algebraic function solutions? If, if that's not the case, you can still ask, are there solutions that can be written in terms of elementary functions? Uh, so all, all of this can be given in algebraic meaning. Uh, if that's not the case, you can ask for special functions, uh, like, like uh, 2F1s, hypergeometrics, or Bessel functions, or so on. So given an equation, is there a solution that can be written something like this? Now, the, the algorithms are getting more and more complicated as you move from top to down. And since I have only 40, 48 minutes, um, I can't explain you all of this, so we will uh, drop this. I don't speak about this. Uh, I, I will explain you the, how to find polynomial solutions and rational solutions. That's, that's not something that I have done. This is very classical and known since the end of the 19th century. But uh, if, if you haven't seen it before, you should see it now. And if you have seen it before, you can check whether you have a better way of explaining it, and afterwards tell me if so. And then, uh, when I'm done with this and this, then I show you something new about finding hyperexponential functions, which we did this year for a computer algebra conference. So let's start with polynomials. Again, the problem is this. Given a differential equation, the question is, is there a polynomial which I can plug in for f so that this equation is satisfied? In this example, that would be uh, two polynomials, that one, x minus 3, and x cubed plus 5. And because it's a third uh, order equation, there is a third solution, but, but that happens to be not a polynomial. So we want, to be, we want the algorithm to find all the polynomials, and it cannot just search forever. It has to recognize at some point that it has found all of them, and the other thing is not a polynomial. We want to be sure about that. So the, the question is very easy. Um, if somebody tells us the degree, so if we are not asking for arbitrary polynomial solutions, but for polynomial solutions of degree 3, let's say. Uh, let's say uh, we have such a polynomial, so we, we know very well how cubic polynomials look like. They all look like this. The, the only variance there is what the coefficients may be. So no matter what the coefficients are, they are independent of x. So I know not only what the x f looks like, but I, can, I also know what its derivatives look like. I can formally differentiate this without knowing what the c's are. So this is f prime, this is f double prime, this is f prime prime prime, uh, regardless of the specific choice of the c's. And now what I have to do is I have to find uh, instantiation for the c's uh, that matches the given differential equation. So I take all these things here, this equation, that one, that one, that one, and plug this into the appropriate parts of the differential equation. Here. Check. Uh, and then this has to be true. Now, what kind of an expression is this? This is an expression in which has x and the c's. So I have them colored here. The, the x is just the x, and the c's, uh, remember, they are the coefficients of the solution we are looking for, so they will not depend on x. So if I write this as a polynomial in x, so by sorting this, reordering this expression, write it like this, then a, a polynomial in x is zero if and only if all its coefficients are zero. So this gives me constraints about the c's. This has to be zero, this has to be zero, this has to be zero, and this has to be zero. So that's a system of linear equations. We can solve it, and it, in this case it has two solutions. One is, corresponds to this vector, one corresponds to this vector, and uh, you recognize these are the coefficients vectors of the, of the polynomials that I showed in the beginning. So the, the, the general solution of this example differential equation is this polynomial, some constant times this, plus some other constant times this. And these are all the polynomial solutions of degree at most 3. Um, it could still be that there is a, a third polynomial solution of degree 12. Um, this is what we have to exclude now. So uh, who will tell us uh, how big the degrees can become? Uh, really? Here. So basically for any alpha and beta this will work? Yeah. No matter what numbers you play, it will always work? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Yeah. 
So the, the solution, uh, the solutions of a differential equation, linear, always form a vector space. Okay. So and these are this here is a basis of this vector space. Okay. So any linear combination of them will be also a solution. Okay. Other questions? Not so far clear. So uh, let's now uh, look at how we get a handle on the degree. Uh, uh, still, this is all very classic. I'm sorry if you know this already. Um, talking to those who don't know it already. So uh, we know in general what a polynomial looks like. We don't know in general what degree it has, but if it has degree b, it will always look like this: some non-zero leading coefficient times x to the d plus lower order terms. And no matter what uh, the degree and the coefficients are, we still know what the derivatives look like uh, because we can formally differentiate this. So the d will come in front if I differentiate, and the exponent will lower by one. And the lower order terms will remain to be lower order terms because if I do this with the next one, I get d minus two. So this is still lower than this one. So I know for all the uh, for for the polynomial uh, of arbitrary degree and for its derivatives what the leading term is. So I can plug again these forms into the differential equation. Plug. Okay, and it will look like this. So this is the polynomial, this is the derivative, and so on. And now I can again look at what happens to the leading term um, of this polynomial. So this is a polynomial. I don't know what degree it has, it has because it has x to the d. But the x to the d appears everywhere here. So I can divide it out. And then there's a certain highest power, which uh, in this case I can calculate uh, without knowing the dot 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 because it, it depends only on this 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 and this uh, and it happens to be this so I, I can factor this here and then this has to be zero because all the coefficients have to be zero uh, with respect to uh, x to the d and this can be zero only if d is equal to 3 or d is equal to 1 hmm. so what I have to do in order to find a bound on the degree for the possible polynomial solution is I have to form this polynomial that I obtain by plugging x to the d into the differential equation and looking at the leading coefficient of the resulting polynomial and its largest integer root is the highest possible degree that a polynomial solution can have. Uh, and, and in fact, it's exactly the degrees. We have seen a cubic solution and a linear solution. They show up here. They cannot be higher order degrees. Solutions. So here we are. Right. So so here's the algorithm. Here's what Maple does when it, when you ask it for finding polynomial solutions. Input is the differential equation. Output is the basis of the vector space of all its polynomial solutions. So the first is you. Oh, I, I forgot to emphasize that this uh, this polynomial which appears there here. This this polynomial. This is called the initial polynomial of the equation. Okay, so because it, it points out the indices, uh, which is an old degree, I mean an old word for degree, right? So you first, you first determine this initial polynomial, then you let d be the largest integer root of this polynomial, then you make an ansatz for uh, an arbitrary polynomial with undetermined coefficients of degree d, where d is this greatest integer root, then with this uh, template of polynomial, you go into the equation and compare coefficients with respect to x. You can do this now because d is a number. You get a linear system. You solve it. Its solutions are the coefficients vectors of the solution. That's it. And that's all we have to say about polynomials. Yes, there's nothing else to be said about polynomials. Questions about polynomials? No. So we go to rational functions. So the problem again is this. If given a differential equation, you want to find now rational function solutions. In this case, for this example, there are two rational function solutions, this one and this one. And there is a third solution again, which is not rational, and we would like to find out exactly this information. So the, the two rational solutions and a proof that n, n, there's no other rational solution. And again, the problem is easy if you know enough. So if you know the denominator, then, uh, then you can reduce it to the previous case. So uh, suppose, suppose we, we take the example from the previous slide, and suppose we are only interested in, uh, in solutions where the denominator is just x. Well, well, then, it, then it's easy. So the numerator is just a polynomial. And no matter what that polynomial is, we, we know what the derivatives of f will look like in terms of the derivatives of u. 
because we can just formally differentiate this. Here they are. This is f, this is f prime, f prime prime, and so on. We can plug this into the differential equation, and we get a new differential equation for u, uh, which is here. And then every polynomial solution of this differential equation gives rise to a rational solution uh, with denominator x of the original equation. Uh, and we have seen before how to find polynomial solutions, so we, find, we know now how to find uh, rational solutions with a prescribed denominator. So the only thing we have to do now is to, to figure out uh, if nobody tells us what the factors can occur in the denominator, or how, how can we see this from the equation. Okay. So there, there are two questions. This question of determining the denominator it breaks into two pieces. The first is to find the, the factors, and the second is to find for each factor the multiplicity with which it can occur in the denominator. So let's talk first about the factors of the denominator, and later about the multiplicity. So let's suppose uh, we have a, a solution which is rational, and we don't know it yet, we just want to see what, how, what, what it implies. So suppose we have a solution which is of the form u over v times p to the e, and p is a factor of the denominator, so we can assume that it doesn't occur in the u and in the v, by choosing the e optimally, right? Uh, and then, then what happens if I differentiate this? Uh, you, uh, you can show uh, by, by a calculation which is uh, nice, but not nice enough to put it on a slide, uh, that when you differentiate this, you will get some stuff here and there, which is co prime with the p. So it's really so that uh, a differentiation, as we would expect, raises the power of, of, the, of, uh, of every factor by one in each step. So this and this are some polynomials, they are messy, I could write them down, but they are messy expressions in terms of u and v and their derivatives, and also p and its derivatives. But you can show that this and this are things which are co-prime, they have no common factors with the p. And here and there and then so on. So now if you assume that the f is a, uh, is a solution of the differential equation, then, uh, then see what happens if you plug it in. So this is the differential equation, I mean it's now just for illustration and purpose a third order equation, but it works for any order. If you plug these forms in, then, then here's what happens. You have here, uh, there's no p here, there's no p there, there's no p in any of the black boxes. Uh, but here you have the p to the e, p to the e plus 1, p to the e plus 2, p to the e plus 3, the plus 3. So if you multiply the whole thing by p to the e plus 3 to get it uh, uh, away from here, then it will show up here in the numerator, because it, it's one more than this. It will show up also here in the numerator, even twice, and also here, even three times. So it shows up here, and there, and there, but not here. Uh, and the whole thing has to be zero, but then it has to show up here or so. Uh, otherwise it wouldn't work out. So, remember that that works because uh, there's no cancellation. The, the, the black, or no, the red one, doesn't contain the P. So multiply, and then, so, so you see, there's P, P, P here, and so there's no P here, there must be a P there. And why is this important? This is important because the a is part of the input. So that, that's one of the coefficients of the differential equation. So the, the, uh, the, the message is, uh, every factor of the denominator of a solution must appear uh, as a factor of the leading coefficient of the, of the given differential equation. <coughs> uh, and that's data that's been just given. So we just have to factor it and look at all the coefficients and, uh, and, and all the factors. And there cannot be anything else. It's a finite, finite uh, set of polynomials. We have to test them all. Uh, and that, that answers the question, which factors can occur? Uh, and next we have to discuss for each of these factors, for each of these p's, with which multiplicity they can occur in the denominator. So what is this e? And uh, well, well, this is a little similar to what I explained before for finding a degree bound for the polynomial solution. So, so maybe I skip this here. Uh, I, I put the slides on, on, my, uh, on my website if you're interested in the details. I don't want to show it twice the same thing. It's, it's, it's really the same thing. So you, get, you, 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 take, uh, you take this 
denominator, this is a symbolic exponent e, plug it into the differential equation, you get a polynomial constraint on the possible multiplicities, take the integer uh, solutions of this polynomial, uh, and these are the candidates. So. And this technique is classical? Oh yes, everything, everything is classical until I yeah. indicate it's not classical anymore. <laughs> so here again is the algorithm. Uh, input, ODE, output, a basis of the vector space of all its rational function solutions. So first you take the leading coefficient, that means the polynomial in front of the highest order derivative in the equation, and let's call them P1 up to Pn. So you have to factorize there. And then for, for each of them, you determine the maximum possible multiplicity by the techniques that I skipped uh, in the interest of time. And then uh, you know every possible rational solution must look like this. Some polynomial divided by, uh, well, the product of the factors that can occur, each raised to its appropriate uh, multiplicity. Okay, and then you know the denominator, so maybe you overshoot, because maybe there's one, po uh, poly uh, one rational solution with this denominator and another one with this, but it doesn't matter, because if you put here too much, uh, this too much will show up in the U and cancel out in the end, so that doesn't matter. Uh, so it's, it's, it's maybe too much, but it's certainly enough. And then, uh, from the given ODE for F, you construct with this pattern here an ODE for the U. And then you use the algorithm from the first part to find the polynomial solutions of this auxiliary equation. And for each polynomial solution, U, this F is a rational solution uh, of, the, of the given equation, and vice versa. They are on to borrow correspondence. Questions? Yeah? What does ansatz mean? Oh, ansatz means like uh, uh, you set up a template for the solution. Ansatz oh. is a, a German word which Doran likes to use a lot. But I don't know how do you explain what ansatz is to people who don't know it. It's a kind of yes. Framework. And you can get yes. yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. So, That's a good one. so you, yeah, okay. And so it's clear what it is? Yeah. So you say every solution must have this form, and there are still some, some parts which you don't know, in this case the U. So you the general idea, you turn upon specifics from the general idea. Yeah. No, yeah, no. so you, you say you're, you're searching for a solution, a rational function solution. Yeah. For a rational function solution, you need a numerator and a denominator. Yeah. And in a priori, you don't, need, you don't know what it is. Now, you make an ansatz by saying, okay, I still don't know what it is, but I know parts of it. So you know the P's at this point of the algorithm. So you say, okay, I'm searching for a rational function solution which has this form, okay. an unknown, unknown uh, numerator, yeah. and then a denominator which I know very well, which I know explicitly. Yeah, so you guess educatedly that it has this particular form, okay. but there's so still something to be found. So, oh, you have to be found. so you reduce the problem of finding a rational solution to one of finding a polynomial solution, which at that point is still undetermined, but it's a simpler kind of solution because that's only polynomial, and you know how to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's all I want to say about rational functions. Questions about rational functions? Everything clear? Good. And now comes the exciting stuff. Let's talk about uh, hyper-exponential functions. So I said already, uh, in, the, in the first slide I only had an example. Now here is really the definition. Uh, a hyper-exponential function or expression or term, as you like, is, uh, uh, is, a, is by definition a solution of a first-order equation. So f is hyper-exponential. If there are two uh, non-zero, I think I should say, uh, polynomials, uh, p and q, such that f satisfies this equation. And so uh, it's very easy to find hyper-exponential solutions of first-order equations because the, the equation itself describes it. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what we have... So there are no constraints on the, uh, the, the degree of p is bigger than q no. or so as anything no. goes? anything is allowed. Okay, so uh, we know from calculus how to solve this in closed form. And in fact, every hyper-exponential expression can be written in closed form, but if you just do what you have learned, so uh, you do a separation of all, everything is f on one side, everything is p and q on the other side, integrate, and then you get a, 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 a log of f there, you exponentiate, then you have f expressed in terms of the p and q. So p and q are polynomials, that means you can even evaluate this integral in closed form, because 
mm, rational integrals can be evaluated. So uh, the, the, the close form of a rational integral is always a rational function plus a linear combination of logarithms, like this. So this is a rational function. And here's the linear combination with some constants, gamma, of a log of some polynomials. And because this is all sitting inside of an exponential function, we can, we can break this apart and write this sum inside the argument as a product of x of rat uh, times a product of uh, x of log, and x of log uh, cancels each other, so the, so the result is then something that looks like this. So this is how, what you should imagine when somebody says hyper-exponential function. It's an uh, exponential of rational function, times a product of several polynomials raised to some constants. So you see it, it splits into two parts, this part and this part. And I will call this part the exponential part and this part the rational part, more or less. So uh, the intuition is that this is kind of a rational function, except of the gammas need not be integers. So if, if you think of the gammas as integers, then this is a rational function. In general, they are not integers, so that's, that's, not, that's not really the, the official definition, but it's the right intuition. Uh, this is the exponential part, this is the rational part. So here, here's the official definition, if you're interested. Uh, uh, we, we care about whether two uh, uh, hyper-exponential functions are similar. So we say they are similar if their quotient is a rational function. Um, and then this is an equivalence relation among hyperexponential terms, and we say that the equivalence classes under this relation they form the exponential part of a, of a given term. So, so here, here are some more fancy examples. This and this is equivalent because the quotient is a rational function. The square root of two cancels out, and there remains a four force in the integer. That's nice. So, so they are okay. They are equivalent. They have the same exponential part. Um, those ones, we say, they do not have the same exponential part, even though on both sides it says x of 0. Uh, but, but the square root of 2 and the 2, they are not, well, they are not at integer distance. And, all, and, and these ones, anyway, they, they have different exponential part, because here there's an x and there's not. So th this is obvious. This is also obvious. And, and this is a technicality that you can neglect if you want. Okay, and then the task is the same as before, more uh, or less. We are given again a differential equation, something like this, linear with polynomial coefficients, and the task is to find the hyperexponential solutions. In this case, there are two hyperexponential solutions, uh, this one and this one. And because the equation in this example has order two, every solution can be written as a linear combination of those two. In general, of course, that's not the case, but I didn't want to make a bigger example. So in general, you will have uh, typically, you will have no solutions of this form, but then, then we want the algorithm to tell us there's definitely no such solution. So, so the question is how, how can we find them? And uh, uh, the idea is similar to before. We reduce it to something that we already know. In this case, we, we reduce it to a rational function solving. And we can do so if somebody tells us what is the exponential part. So if we, if we know that, let's say, we, we are looking for uh, a solution that has this exponential part and then some rational function, then, then we know very well what the derivatives of f look like because we can differentiate this as many times as we want and get expressions that depend on very explicit stuff and the derivatives of u, which is an unknown rational function at this point. So here's what it looks like. It's, it's uh, u, u prime, u, u prime prime, u prime, u, not known, and there are some rational functions that appear from uh, differentiating the stuff. So they enter here, but it doesn't matter what they really are, because we can compute them explicitly as soon as we know what the exponential part is. Okay, and then you have again an ansatz, yeah? because uh, uh, you know, I mean, we assume here, we know it has to look like this with an unknown rational function, so you plug this into the differential equation, um, and then it happens that this here appeared, uh, well, th this exponential part appeared in, in every derivative, so I can't cancel it out. And what remains is, a, a, is an equation which we understand very well. It's a linear differential equation with polynomial coefficients uh, for the unknown rational function u. So I use the algorithm from before, 
to uh, find its rational solutions. And every rational uh, function u gives rise to a hyper-exponential solution of the original equation with this prescribed uh, exponential 